Greetings programs. My name is Michael Broadhead. Can I get a show of hands? How many people here know what a theremin is? It's a lot of folks, good. Um, how many would recognize a theremin if you saw one in the wild? Who here has played a theremin? Give a shout out. Wow, shit ton of people. That is great. Wow, I would, my, my, my bet was two people. So you people have surpassed my expectation, expectations. You rock as always, so thank you. So the theremin is the first mass-produced electronic musical instrument, and one of the first electronic instruments, period. The unusual thing about the theremin is you can play it without actually touching it. The distance of the player's hand to that vertical antenna there controls the pitch, and the distance of the other hand to the horizontal antenna controls the amplitude or volume. And the result is something like this. <laughs> So the sound of the theremin is synonymous with spooky 1950s science fiction movies like Forbidden Planet, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and, and many, many more. That eerie whistling sound that you hear when the UFO is in motion or something else portentous is happening is a theremin. And the theremin has made its way into a lot of, of popular music. So the, the better known examples are the Beach Boys' Good Vibrations and Led Zepp's Whole Lot of Love. Now, some of you, I was sort of expecting to be heckled on this, and I'm, I'm pleased that you didn't, <laughs> that uh, we'll, we'll say that, that Good Vibrations wasn't actually a theremin, so that what they used in Good Vibrations was an off-brand theremin. <laughs> called it... <laughs> called an electro theremin. And it's a little bit easier to play, but look. Brian Wilson calls it a theremin. We can call it a theremin too. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> so the whole story starts with this guy, Leon Theremin, or his given name was Lev Sergeyevich Theremin. He was born, as you might guess from the name, in Russia, specifically St. Petersburg in 1896. I almost said 1986, which is a separate kind of a deal. Um, <laughs> By the time Lev was in high school, he was already giving performances in front of audiences of electronic gadgets that he'd built. When he was 17, he made friends with a bunch of people in the physics department at the nearby university and actually attended one guy's thesis defense as a high school student and then was able to speak with him intelligently about the material afterwards. And the folks that he made friends with in the physics department were so impressed by him that they actually gave him a workspace there as, as a high school student, which was pretty cool. Then World War I happened and he got drafted into the army and the Russian Revolution happened. Through all of this, he was still able to complete his education. But by the time it was done, he didn't love his job situation. So fortunately, he was talking, he had friends in high places, he was talking to one of his physics buddies and the physics buddy said, hey, I run this research institute now. Why don't you come work for me? I'm slouching here, so I gotta. There, that's better. Um, why don't you come work, work for me? So Le Lev took him up in the offer, and while he was at the institute, he worked on many different projects. Actually, video interlacing was, a, was a, an early thing that he worked on. And one day, he was mucking about with the insides of a radio, and a sound came out, and he realized that that sound had not come from the airways, but it originated within the device itself. And so that made some wheels start turning in his head. So later when he was asked to build a meter to measure gas density, he gave it an audio output so the density of the gas would be reflected in the pitch of the tone coming out of the meter. So this was great, but no sooner did he build it than he realized that having his hand near it also altered the pitch. And he was actually able to pick out a little melody just by moving his hand back and forth. And this caught the attention of everybody in the lab. Now, Theremin loved physics, but he was also a showman. He says as he does the non-showmanly thing. Um, <laughs> he was also a showman, and he knew a good thing when he saw it. So he built a musical instrument uh, based on the same principles that was originally called the Ethervox. And by the end of 1920, he had given his first concert with the thing, and it, it created a sensation. 
So there were more concerts and more sensations, and he toured all over Russia with this thing, creating a stir everywhere he went. Now, the, the device that he was, was playing was actually fairly simple. People knowledgeable in electronics have called it ingeniously simple. This is a schematic that Bob Moog drew for Clara Rockmore in the 1980s. Yeah, Bob Moog. And uh, actually, my old guitar teacher plays a metal band and appears with a, with a Moog t-shirt on stage. Kind of cool. Um, but anyway. Um, We'll hear more about Claire Rockmore in a bit, but as you can see, there's not a ton of stuff compared to a lot of the devices we take for granted. If we want to use modern off-the-shelf parts, then with this even simpler design, you can build a working theremin for about 20 bucks. But uh, technology aside, let's hear what a theremin sounds like in the hands of a skilled practitioner. This is Pamela Stickney. She used to be Pamela Kirsten. And you're going to hear, it's about a 30 second clip, you're going to hear the tail end of a chorus of Autumn Leaves and then the very beginning of a solo. So, god damn, she's good. I, I listened to a lot of theremin music in preparing for this, and I didn't hear anybody else who could do those sort of percussive attacks and discrete notes without portamento in between them. She's just, just phenomenal. And she has a lot of other music, too, which is good. It's not all theremin-centric, but, but Pamela Stickney rocks. But back to our pal Lev. Lev was so successful touring in Russia that he wound up touring in Western Europe and then came to the United States. When he got to the United States, he decided he wanted to stay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, funny how that works. Um, well, we'll see how that continues. But um, it, thanks to a patron, he was able to get not only an apartment, but he had a, a workshop and a studio in the same building, which is pretty cool. And he even like, had assistants helping him out. And he licensed the design to R RCA. And he assembled what he called a theremin orchestra. And they actually had their debut performance at Carnegie Hall, which is kind of a big deal. So things are going super well for Lev Theremin. And it was during this period in his life that he met a fellow Russian emigre named Clara Rockmore. And you can see from, look, look at this facial expression. I mean, I mean, just look at that. That, that. I know that face. And that face is not about electronic musical instruments, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it just really is not. So clearly the dude is smitten. He proposed marriage to her multiple times, but she wasn't having it. She married a guy, an attorney named Rockmore, and I'm sure he was fine. That's fine. <laughs> but <laughs> d despite that, they still became very close and worked closely together. She became a theremin virtuosa. Claire Rockmore helped to refine the design of the theremin thanks to her input. Lev increased the, the, the range of notes that it could play, and he improved the linearity of the antennas, which means the distance between the notes is more consistent, which makes it easier to play in tune. She also developed a finger technique that we saw Pam Stinkney use there, where in addition to moving her hand back and forth, she also changed the position of her fingers, and that allows more fine-grained control over the pitch. Meanwhile, Lev's a big cheese. He's palling around with celebrities. He's buds with Albert Einstein. He married a dancer. He's giving concerts. He's making more and more gadgets, some musical instruments, some other things. And overall, having a great time. And then suddenly, poof, he's gone. What the hell happened? <laughs> hey, practically. So his wife saw the whole deal. Russian agents came into their home with guns, pointed those guns at Lev Theremin, and said, you are coming with us. And they dragged his ass out. And his friends were freaking out. They're utterly bereft. They, they had no idea what was going on. You know, presumably they brought this guy back to Russia, but they didn't even know that. And is he in jail? Is he dead? What's going on? Anybody with any sort of contacts, either here or in the Soviet Union, tapped those, those networks to try and find out what was going on, and nobody was able to learn anything. The, the composer Shostakovich actually intimated that Lev Theremin was not a safe topic for him to be discussing. 
So eventually all the, lead, the leads ran cold and, and people had to go on with their lives. Their friends went, went out without them and Claire Rockmore continued to work, to perform, to tour. And years went by. In seven years, she was on tour in Russia and hosted a reception to, so that fans could come and meet her, or, or as she said, so people could have the dubious distinction of meeting me. And one of the people at the reception happened to say that he was a scientist. So her husband said, yeah, thank you, um, said, oh, you're a scientist. Do you know Terman? Like, what the hell, man? Of course he doesn't. But he said, well, yeah, I had lunch with him yesterday. And then walked away and literally left the event. <laughs> So what the hell? So somebody must have chased him down because they were able to set up a meeting. But of course, they had to be very careful. So it was a furtive meeting in the hallway of a subway station. And the, yeah, it was full Snowden, a blanket over the head and all that. Um, and meanwhile, they're all like looking around them to make sure nobody's eavesdropping. And they chatted for a while and then eventually parted ways. And, and Clara Rockmore and her husband went back to New York. Lev Thurman stayed in the Soviet Union. Which brings us to the question of what the hell he was doing. He was essentially held captive, although over time he had gradually more freedom, and he was forced to work on spy gadgets for the organization that became the KGB. And that is this whole other amazing story that we don't have time to get into. Alas, so we're gonna have to do part two at some point. So the, the contraption that, that brings Lev Terman to our attention tonight had a foundational role in electronic music. So now we have infinite control over timbre. We're no longer constrained by conventional tunings or even a 12-note octave. You want to have an 11-note octave or 15-note octave, you can do that. It sounds horrible, but, but people do it. Um, and we, we, <laughs> says me, says me. Um, <laughs> Um, we can build devices called sequencers that will play the instruments for us so one musician can play many instruments at once or they can play parts that otherwise would be beyond their ability. That's how I got through harmony classes in college without keyboard chops is a sequencer. We can also do, we can make what's called generative music where rather than specifying exactly what to play, we define rules and then we just see what emerges. And Theremin's work planted the seeds that turned into all of that, and all of these electronic musicians, and many, many more. Um, incidentally, if you know who these folks are, come see me afterwards. I will buy a cocktail for whoever can, can name all eight musicians uh, correctly. <laughs> One I know is a giveaway for you. Um, so, and just to underscore, Theremin's role in this, I want to read this, this line from, from Bob Moog that I really liked. The Theremin specifically, and Leon Theremin's work in general, is the biggest, fattest, most important cornerstone of the whole electronic music medium. Now that's a hell of an endorsement. So with a contribution of that magnitude, I'm, I'm happy to say that our story has a happy ending. In 1991, Lev Theremin returned to the United States he got to see his old friends. He got to visit his old haunts. He was honored by the leading lights of electronic music research in the United States. And when it was done, he packed his things and he went back to Russia, not because he was forced to, but because he chose to. And so I feel all right about that. And I'm gonna raise my glass to Lev Terman and to Clara Rockmore and say, Thank you. <laughs>